we work with employment law attorneys all across the country to publish HR manuals, um, guidance to HR professionals and employers on state-specific employment law. And with every purchase of a book, you get a webinar subscription. We do two of these every month, um, and that is for 12 months. So I will put all of that information if you are interested in purchasing um, in the follow-up email and in the chat. Um, and so I want to introduce Philip Bachnight. He is an expert on all this stuff. He's the perfect person to walk us through all of this stuff. Um, Philip is joining us from the, the New Jersey um, Philip, uh, Fisher Phillips office, correct? Yes, Philip from Fisher and Phillips, yes. New Jersey, yeah. <laughs> it's confusing. Well, I thank you it. so much for joining us, Phil. I'm really excited to have you here. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to turn it over to you now. Let's get Great. started. Great. So uh, first of all, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I'm glad to be here, and I, and I hope that you find this presentation uh, both informative and engaging. Our goal here is to provide an update on the recent uh, guidance issued by OSHA uh, regarding, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to do spoiler alert. They're they're planning to be more aggressive in 2023 and going forward. But but the goal here is to to is, is twofold. It's really to uh, educate the audience about what their new aggressive initiatives are going to be, but also talk about uh, things that you as an employer or a representative for your employer can do. Uh, to make your workplace safer. And the reason why that's important, uh, first of all, is that, you know, safe workplace is, is, is a better workplace. Uh, there's business uh, reasons for having a safe workplace. And also it helps to uh, reduce potential exposure should OSHA show up uh, for an inspection. Uh, there's, 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 there's nothing you can really do to prevent OSHA from showing up. I mean, you can have the safest workplace you want, but an employee can make a complaint. Uh, there could be a referral. There could be a variety of different options that could lead to OSHA showing up at your work site. Uh, but there are many things that you can do to make your, your workplace um, as safe as you reasonably can to help limit yourself from potential exposure during the course of an on-site inspection. Uh, and so we're going to cover both of those areas uh, today uh, because I didn't want to just come here and say, hey, man, or hey, hey, hey team, everything's going to be uh, you know a little bit more aggressive. Uh, sorry, you know, I want to give you tips as well and practical things that you can practically use. Uh, so the first thing we want to talk about is, is, is why we're here. Uh, there was a press release uh, on January 26, 2023 uh, from OSHA, uh, and it talks about, uh, you know, a memorandum that was issued by OSHA uh, and where they announced uh, new enforcement guidance. And the, the goal of this new enforcement guidance is to make penalties more effective in stopping employers, as you see there, from repeat, repeatedly exposing workers to life-threatening hazards or failing to comply with uh, certain workplace safety and health requirements. Uh, the goal also is to save lives. Uh, and again, you know, targeting employers who put profit over safety and to increase great, greater employer accountability for safety and health failures. Uh, and the rationale uh, from OSHA's perspective behind these goals is that you know, um, people still get hurt at workplaces and they found that, um, you know, when they've been less aggressive and when the penalties are not as high as they could be, uh, sometimes the, 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 the threat or the, the concern of citations is not the deterrent that OSHA would hope that it would be. And so by in announcing and implementing these new uh, enforcement initiatives, the goal is to kind of juice up uh, the power already afforded to OSHA to make employers really think twice about their workplace safety practices in an effort to uh, motivate, let's say, employers to uh, take the steps necessary to try and create the most safe and uh, workplaces that are reasonably possible. Uh, there's two main aspects of the new measures, and one is instance by instance citations, and the second aspect is discouragement of grouping. Um, the new measures will cover the general industry, agriculture, maritime, and construction industries, and the effective date is actually Monday, uh, March 27th, and so that this presentation, and Amy and I talked about it uh, before we had it, is that this presentation at this time uh, would be especially important and timely and of relevance to the audience because, um, you know, the, the new guidance and the new measures can be implemented and utilized by OSHA 
on Monday. Uh, and so it's good to hear about this now. So you can uh, you can go back to your employer or if you, you are managing the, you know, the management level employees for your employee or the uh, safety professionals, uh, you can begin uh, to, to make these measures or kind of fine tune them. Because my guess is that if you guys are attending this presentation, you're already somewhat aware of this. Uh, and hopefully this is just kind of a, a tune up for you as, as these new uh, measures come into effect. So I want to talk about each of these measures individually. The first one is instance uh, by instance citations. And uh, it's important to understand what an instance by instance citation is. And so as a little bit of background, when OSHA conducts an on-site inspection, if they see safety hazards, they typically would issue citations per hazard. So if there's you know, a lockout tagout issue or a machine guarding issue on a particular machine, they will issue a citation for that hazard related to that machine. Um, you know, if there's not uh, you know, uh, you know, a fall protection provided to employees, for example, they'll issue a citation for you know, not providing fall protection, not having the appropriate training records as a whole. But with the instance by instance citation method, and typically it was uh, it was limited to to much. It was it was a, it could only be utilized in limited circumstances. Um, you know, now, for example, if there is a lockout tag, tag out issue, you can instant, you can issue a say, they'll be able to issue a citation, for example, every employer that was exposed to the hazard. So if you have 10 employees uh, performing, you know, uh, preventative maintenance on a machine, and they all fail to lock out tag out, rather than one citation for that hazard, there's the potential for arguably 10 citations, because it's instance by instance. Uh, I've seen some analysis where, uh, there's concern that the uh, instance by instance could, uh, you know, if it's a record keeping issue or, or something like that, could also apply per employee per day. Uh, that will remain to be seen how aggressive OSHA will be. Uh, but the 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 context of that is, is, is significant just in terms of if you have a maximum penalty, let's say uh, fifteen thousand dollars, if you're not looking at a repeat. And before it was fifteen thousand dollars, let's say for a lockout tagout violation on a particular machine. Uh, now, if you have fifteen and or you know employees who are exposed to that hazard or machine guarding, there's fifteen employees for this uh, particular machine, a grinder or something like that. Uh, you know, fifteen employees times fifteen thousand uh, dollars is, and you do that for four different citations where there's you know fifteen employees each. You're looking at potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars in citations as opposed to um, you know somewhere between you know fifty to a hundred thousand dollars for 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 you know in the in the past. And so it's 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 certainly significant and OSHA now has that at their disposal. And I wanted to explain that um, uh, just just so you can understand. Uh, the guidance provides that regional directors and uh, area directors can issue instant by instance citations for high gravity serious violations. The conditions include lockout tagout, machine guarding, permit required to find space. Respiratory protection falls, and uh, one other than serious violations specific to record keeping, and so that could be um, that could be a, a a ripe area for ish, instance by instance citation simply because there's so many uh, you know specific uh, regulations that have record keeping uh, requirements, and so you know failure to uh, comply with these requirements could result in uh, you know heavy fines, especially if you're able to do it or OSHA tries to do it. Uh, Per, per day, for example. And so that's something certainly uh, to be concerned about. And also uh, it's important to notice that a lot of these issues, for example, lockout, tagout, machine guarding, respiratory protection, falls, they are all on um, OSHA's top 10 most cited uh, safety hazards. And so OSHA puts out a list each year of their you know, uh, top cited safety hazards. And, and, and many of these are on there consistently. And like I said, falls, respiratory protection, machine guarding, lockout, tagout, those are all OSHA favorites. And now to have an expanded capacity and power to issue instance by instance citations uh, for these type of uh, conditions uh, in various circumstances uh, certainly increases the potential for higher exposure uh, and more monetary uh, and more significant monetary penalties for employers. Um, these are the there's instance by instance factors that 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 can be considered that should be considered and the factors are here uh, is that the employers received a willful a repeat or a failure to abate violation within the past five years where that classification is current 
uh, the employer has failed to report a fatality, uh, an inpatient hospitalization, amputation, or loss of an eye. Uh, the proposed citations are related to a fatality or catastrophe, and uh, the proposed record keeping citations are related to an illness or injury. So these are different factors that can be considered. Uh, and so, um, you know, if you're a large uh, nationwide facility, let's say, uh, that operates in manufacturing or bottling or plastic or, you know, uh, landscaping or marinas or whatever the case may be, there's a chance that one of your facilities may have uh, received a, a willful or, or real a repeat or failure to abate within the last five years. Uh, we're going to talk about later why it's very important to understand your past citation history because that could factor in to whether or not you could be eligible uh, for an instance by instance citation. Um, and these are and also the other factors as well are certainly to be considered. Uh, but those are the factors. Um, other considerations in, uh, include it that the citations could be applied when the text of the relevant standard allows, such as per machine, location, entry employee. So you have to look at the uh, text of the site, you know, the relevant standard as well. Um, and it could also be uh, instance by instance citations could be appropriate according to OSHA when uh, a single method of, of abatement would not, uh, you know, be able to to cure the hazard, or if there's uh, inspector documentation recommendations. So again, those are just other instances for considerations, but it's certainly something uh, to be aware of. Uh, and as you can see, it's, it provides a, a pretty broad range of, of areas and, and opportunities to issue instance by instance citations. Uh, grouping discouragement, that was the other key takeaway from this guidance. And grouping the grouping discouragement really is just kind of like adding uh, more oomph to the fact that, you know, you should do instance by instance citations because um, the, it's a reminder not to group citations. And a group citation was that, again, you could have uh, this machine that had a lockout tag out issue or a guarding issue. And rather than doing it by instance by instance, we were like, hey, each employee is a specific instance that needs to be cited. We're just going to group this as one violation. So we're going to say, you know, failure to comply with lockout tag out, uh, failure to have machine guarding, failure to provide training, uh, and that, and you would just group it together. Each instance would be grouped together. Um, and rather than doing that, um, they're, they, they're just saying, hey, listen, you have the power to issue uh, instance by instance citations under various circumstances. And they, they included a link uh, to the, the previous guidance on the instance by instance citations, uh, you know, guidance to say, hey, listen, just so you know, you don't, you don't need to group them. Uh, we, we discourage you from grouping them. Uh, make sure you look at this thoroughly. And if there's a chance to, do, to utilize the instance by instance citations uh, method, uh, then you should strongly consider that. And so that those are those are uh, the two really uh, areas of aggressiveness, and they kind of, they they really stack on each other. Um, and yeah, one of the interesting things I see here is that you know uh, you know they think employers would be encouraged to comply with the OSHA Act, the OSHA Act through citations. Uh, and so you know, right? It's 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 it's, it's encouragement by uh, punishment, sort of you know punitive measures. You know, it's. Uh, it's, it's, it's the stick rather than the carrot. And though, you know, uh, if you can issue citations, then that will pro provide a, a, uh, a measure to make uh, employers want to comply going forward. Uh, so the key takeaways from these developments are, you know, more aggressiveness. That was on, uh, like I said, spoiler alert, that was on page one of the slides. Uh, but there's going to be an increased OSHA focus on high risk industries and employers who repeatedly violate safety regulation, rec regulations. Uh, you know, employers should expect more frequent and ins aggressive inspections, as well as stiffer penalties for violations. Uh, in, in our experience, OSHA uh, will, will typically tries to uh, utilize the, all the authority that, that they have at their disposal, and, and this certainly provides more, uh, you know, tools for them to utilize to, to, to have more aggressive inspections and to uh, issue stiffer penalties, so don't be surprised uh, when that happens. Um, and, you know, as it says there, OSHA has the authority to utilize increased aggressiveness, aggressiveness in that, and we expect they're going to do so. So those are the developments uh, from this and that employers uh, and safety professionals need to be aware of. Uh, but as I said, there, there, there's hope, right? You should not feel as if there is no hope uh, because there are steps that, oil, that employers can take to help mitigate the risk and help to increase uh, the safety in their work. 
uh, forces and their work sites and, all, and to be more compliant. And so I want to talk about six tips that employers can utilize uh, to improve their workplace safety practices, which can help uh, limit exposure. And so we're going to talk about each one of these separately, but just that's the agenda. And, and we're going to talk about, you know, you need to assess your company's vulnerability. Uh, you need to review your company's OSHA record keeping um, efforts. You need to perform routine audits. And we're going to spend some a decent amount of time talking about that because that is a very good way uh, to really identify potential issues uh, before OSHA gets there and take the appropriate corrective action. You need to focus on your training. Uh, you're gonna have to review your records uh, for correcting your past violations and also your records of past citations and proper documentation. So with that being said, talk about the first one, uh, assess your company's vulnerability. Uh, and you know, I, I apply this really in uh, all aspects of, of my life, but uh, you know, it certainly applies here is that an ounce of uh, cures with a pound of prevention. Uh, and so, you know, the more that you can do in advance to be prepared, it just has a, a much uh, better effect on your company and the impact is much more significant. And so you want to assess your company's vulnerability. And as, I, as we talked about before, uh, you know, employers and businesses that operate in high risk areas uh, would probably have a greater impact for vulnerability because that's where OSHA is, is paying a lot of attention is going is going to show up. So and I, what I mean by that is so if you're in an office, you know, especially now that COVID is over, uh, you know, that's not typically where OSHA is, is directing their attention. They can, uh, you know, uh, because you're an employer, but, you know, OSHA would a, a business that does, for example, construction or trenching or, you know, a uh, um, uh, you know, a bottling or plastics manufacturer. Uh, those are industries that are more on OSHA's radar uh, because there's more machinery. There's more, you know, potential safety hazards there where people or indi individuals and employees could have severe injuries uh, and fatalities. You know, the, the chances of having a fatality while you're typing at your keyboard are relatively small. The chances of a fatality while you're on a crane you know, uh, 200 feet high working on a, a building or doing some roofing work, uh, it, it, you know, if you don't have the necessary fall protection or PPE is, 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 is significant, or if you're doing, you know, trenching or confined spaces or in permit confined spaces and things of that nature. And so that you need to look at your type of business. Uh, you'll also want to see what, start to evaluate what plans and policies you have. If the first question you ask, if the first question you ask is what plans and policies do we have for safety? And the answer is none. Well, uh, if you're in a business that's a high risk, that's that's a big vulnerability. And then you're going to want to start to dig in to see what plans and policies you do have, but also whether those plans and policies are compliant. Uh, you're going to want to evaluate your safety culture. You're going to want to make sure that there's manager and staff commitment. Uh, we see so many times where, especially you know, in, in large, large companies, uh, with, with with facilities across the country that uh, sometimes these companies grew because of mergers and acquisitions where they then absorbs another, uh, you know, another company's safety personnel and their safety culture. And sometimes that culture is good, but sometimes you have the safety professionals and or the work the employees who are like, listen, I've been doing this for so many years, so and so many years, never had an injury. I don't need PPE. I don't need training. I know how to do it. Uh, we're not going to, you know, we don't, we don't need that. And the reality is that no, you do. And it's required. Uh, but that's, that's a big issue that we often see is that when you have uh, locations in multiple areas, um, the culture could, could vary per area. And sometimes that can, that can cause a real headache for uh, an employer trying to create instill a, a, a positive uh, safety culture. Uh, you're going to look at your incident history. You're going to want to develop, and then you're going to want to develop an action plan as well to determine what needs to be done to fix the vulnerabilities or to address the vulnerabilities. And again, part of that too will be to understand uh, your compliance standards and what's required of you as an employer. And that's going to be understanding the regulations that apply uh, to the various operations. And, you know, you employers, you'd be surprised about how many different uh, OSHA regulations can apply in a, in a given facility. And so understanding what those are and also understanding what OSHA uh, oftentimes looks for uh, during an on-site inspection will be important. Uh, and so that those are some of the things that you will need to do to assess 
uh, your company's uh, vulnerability. Um, you're going to want to review your record keeping, and, and that is very important. Uh, you know, one of the most cited safety issues is poor record keeping. So that's in the top 10 as well. Uh, and record keeping is, is important for a variety of reasons. The first reason is that OSHA requires uh, employers to maintain several types of records. So, you know, if we're talking about, you know, your 300 logs, well, OSHA requires you to maintain them for five years. And if OSHA shows up on your premises as for a part of an on-site inspection, those records are required to be provided uh, within four hours. Uh, and so, you know, if you don't have those records, well, that's a citation. Uh, you know, there's there's certain standards that require different type of re records. So if you have a hazard communication plan or you're dealing with bloodborne pathogens, uh, there's certain st st requirements uh, and records that are going to need to be kept, maintained, created, and kept uh, as part of those standards. Uh, and so those are things to understand. It's important to understand what the different requirements are for uh, your record keeping and then also understand what you have and don't have. Uh, you know, oftentimes it's a really good idea to have record keeping audits um, because, you know, there's so many different records that could apply. Uh, and, you know, you, you sometimes you may think you have what you need, but your 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 policies, your documents, they're non-compliant and then you're still uh, run into issues. You may you, have, you need to make sure uh, also that you're reporting appropriately and understand the time frame for the various types of injuries and understand uh, what needs to be recorded, what needs to be reported, uh, what needs to be recorded but not reported. And those are things that can really trip up an a company. And so understanding that is important. And one of the important things about records um, is that they really can help prove compliance even when it's not explicitly required. So Sometimes you may have, uh, you know, there's a requirement in, in OSHA regulation for, for training. Uh, you need forklift training, for example, or you may need, uh, you know, a fire extinguisher. Uh, you may need to fire extinguisher training. Well, if you have the fire extinguisher training, OSHA citation may not say, well, you need a record documenting it. But if you don't have documentation to show that you conducted the training, how can you prove that the training occurred? Right. And so understanding, that record keeping isn't just necessarily helpful or it's not just required under citations. If you're thinking about it big picture in order to limit exposure, uh, you know, you're going to want to have documentation for the things and the requirements, uh, you know, let's say for like training and things of that nature, even though there's not a, a record to record the training, but you're going to need that to prove it to OSHA. And one thing I always say, you know, is that if it's not recorded, it didn't happen. You know, it just that's just a rule of thumb. And so if you're in an, in an inspection and OSHA says, OK, you know, and, and OSHA is going to ask for these records. OK, well, you know, I want to see all your train. I want to see your training records for this. I want to see your training records for that. You know, I want to see these different type of records. And if your response is, well, you know, OSHA said I had to conduct a training. It said I did, didn't say I had to record it. Um, you know, that's not really going to go very far. And so records can be very helpful in proving compliance. And so understanding uh, your your company's record keeping uh, requirements can be is, is really important, especially because now OSHA has issued the guidance saying that they can issue instance by instance citations uh, for you know you know poor poor record keeping in various circumstances, and so that's a that's a real easy area for OSHA to come in and say, okay, you know I heard that there's this injury, uh, you know I want to inspect this machine and give me all your records for this 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 and this, and if you don't. Uh, you could get you could get uh, you know hit with some serious fines that add up pretty quickly. Uh, you're going to want to perform routine audits, uh, or you should strongly uh, consider that. And so audits are something that I always suggest companies uh, and should 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 do. Uh, you know, sometimes some, and listen, some companies don't want to do them. They're like, well, you know, they're too expensive, or you know, it's going to take too long. I'd rather just you know, um, deal, deal, deal with my chances. And, and, and when OSHA shows up, we've never been cited by it before. OSHA's never shown up. And, you know, if you like gambling, uh, you know, you can certainly try that. Uh, but it's not something I would recommend because audits really can help an employer identify potential issues in advance and also help them identify um, potential options to abate the hazards before OSHA shows up. Uh, and you can do it in a, in, a, in a time period if you're using a routine audit where you're not, you know, you don't have OSHA breathing down your neck and you have time to evaluate it. You have time to make the necessary changes and get things where they need to be. 
And so one of the benefits of OSHA of audits, uh, and, and so when I say audits, I mean audits that you as the employer uh, do yourself, right? And so there's different ways to do them, but the goal was to help protect employee safety and health. And uh, it could show if you needed to produce the results of your audit that diligent that you made a diligent effort uh, for regulatory compliance. Uh, you know, you can identify uh, potential safety and health hazards before the injuries occur, and, and there's there's value there. I mean, if you wait till after, that means somebody probably got hurt. You know, and so the the you know OSHA inspection and citations issues notwithstanding, uh, you know. If you wait, you run the risk that you're not aware of of the potential safety and health hazards on your workplace. uh, And some of your valued employees could get really hurt. Uh, And, you know, that's not that's something that, you know, no, no employee wants. It impacts morale. uh, You know, it impacts. Yeah, impacts morale. It impacts the, the, you know, the uh, the goodwill of the of of your brand. It it impacts your brand and it impacts your reputation. Uh, And so, you know. If you can avoid those issues, you're going to have a more productive and happy workplace and a more productive and happy workplace uh, means better results for a company. Uh, And so when you're talking about perform audits, they can vary in scope. Uh, You could and you you could do it certain ways. So there's you can conduct an audit by yourself. um, But if you conduct an audit by yourself, there's typically it's typically not going to be privileged. It's not going to be protected. And what that means is that. The results of this audit report, you're going to, if, if there's an issue, OSHA can say, let me see, you know, any, uh, you know, documents related to your, your efforts to evaluate these issues or your knowledge of these issues. And if you, if you had an audit that you did yourself uh, or that your company did itself, um, it'd be, it'd be probably required to be produced. There's some common law uh, self audit privilege, but it's very, you know, it, it's it's very weak, and you know, most most courts don't recognize it, uh, you know, because the, there's a public interest in producing that information is is the argument on the other side. Uh, if it's just kind of a self audit privilege, um, but if you have an attorney, if you have uh, an attorney or your counsel directing the audit or conducting the audit themselves, uh, then that'll be protected by the attorney client privilege. Uh, and that can be very helpful, and we'll talk about it a little bit more later. But when you're doing an audit, whether it's you know uh, the employee, you know employees themselves at your at your direction as the you know director of the company, or through an attorney, you, the good thing is that you can put together a report, and you want the report to list all the observations. You want to list uh, the observations. You want to have photos in it. You know, ideally, you want to be able to cite to the um, potential citations or hazards that the sent the potential regulations that are at issue, the potential citations that could result. And you want to make this, you know, as comprehensive as possible so that when you're evaluating the safety hazards and what needs to be done, um, you, you have, uh, you know, a full body of work to, to, to evaluate. And so a formal report is really helpful there. Um, there's, there's tips, there's several auditing tips that I, that I think are really helpful is that you want to protect the confidentiality of the audit information. And this is to the extent possible. And that's why it's really Helpful, especially when you have a, an attorney or counsel who, who's familiar or specializes in workplace safety that, you know, they may be able to do uh, the audit for you. Uh, and in that way, it'll be protected by the attorney client privilege. Um, and then they can go through, they can audit it, they can prepare a formal report, they can identify uh, the potential citations, uh, they can identify potentially the costs that it would that it would be to the company if they were cited for these issues. They can include recommendations for abatement hazards, um, and so you know, uh, ha- having the attorney uh, an attorney do it uh, or, or being involved in that, uh, you know, is helpful. Again, if you're going to have an attorney involved, uh, you can't just CC them a copy of them on the email. That's not going to cut it. They have to be involved in a capacity where they can provide legal advice uh, to trigger uh, the attorney-client privilege. Um, and you have to understand that the goal of the report is not just to say, hey, look, we conducted an audit report, you know, we care about safety. You also have to be able to respond to the hazards. So you have to understand in advance, listen, we don't know what we're going to find, but whatever we find, we need to be willing and able to take the necessary steps to, uh, address these hazards. And so that means you're going to need to have buy-in from the appropriate decision makers in advance that we're doing this for the purpose of identifying the hazards to try and address the issues that uh, may occur. I've had instances where we've identified things that have required subsequent testing. We've had to, 
uh, you know, get, uh, you know, testing by various, uh, you know, industrial hygienists to evaluate issues. And that's kind of what's required once you, once you identify particular issues and that those can be uh, additional costs. But, you know, as, as we always tell our clients that, listen, it's going to be worse if OSHA finds this and cites you because then you're going to have to do the testing anyway. Uh, but now you're going to have to deal with citations and potential litigation and things of that nature. So it's better to do it in advance. Um, the, the, the audit should, again, document the, the steps to respond to the hazard. So being prepared to respond is good. Then you need to respond. Uh, also, since it's an audit report, uh, you, can't, you can't tell the auditor, hey, come in, but, you know, um, don't really, only tell me the good things. You know, the whole point of the audit is to identify is to have a, you know, a third party come in to identify the potential hazards and their, their job, uh, whoever the auditor is or who's conducting is to, to give you a, uh, a candid and transparent assessment of the potential hazards. And so, uh, you know, it's not recommended that, you know, uh, as a company, if you're going to have an audit, you kind of put limitations on, on how, how they can report to you. Uh, you need to take them seriously. Uh, and, 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 and again, if you're having audit and if you made it all the way to step Five, you probably are taking them seriously. And again, uh, you should consider having audits conducted or, or directed uh, by counsel. Again, for if not anything else, the attorney-client privilege uh, issue to protect the results. And now again, you may decide later on that, you know, if it's if something happens later on, uh, but you abated it and you did training and things of that nature, you, you could, could say, hey, maybe I want to uh, waive the privilege uh, to show that we, we abated it and we, we did everything we were supposed to do. You know, that would depend on the circumstances and you can cross that bridge when you get there, but at least having a system in place to uh, make it confidential at the outset is, is, a, is a good approach. Uh, you know, like I said, we do them all, all the time and for, you know, that's, the, that's one of the reasons is that that way it's protected by uh, privilege and you can have these discussions and figure out what needs to be done uh, without the concern that, uh, you know, it's automatically uh, available to be disclosed. Uh, you want to focus on training and there's there's OSHA has a lot of regulations that require annual training uh, and some employers are aware of and some they're not and so it's important uh, to to have the annual training th these trainings and some some are less than annual but it's important to know um, you know you're also going to want to be aware of the fact that if OSHA shows up because of an incident one of the first things that they're going to say is all right give me your employee training records for whatever it is and again, this is one of those examples where um, there may not be a, rec a, re a requirement to keep records of the annual training or the training. But if you don't have records of the training, how can you prove to OSHA that it occurred? Uh, you know, you could you could have employees, maybe maybe employees will say, yeah, it, it, it happened. But oftentimes employees will say, yeah, I, I don't remember. I think there was something, but I don't know if it was related to this issue or that issue. And so having that documentation uh, it, it is really, really important, and I, and I can't stress that enough. You want to focus on the training. You want it to be uh, consistent, but you also want to keep records of the training because, um, you know, I can't, I can't guarantee, I can't guarantee anything. But I'm pretty confident if there's an incident, OSHA's asking for those training records, uh, and so you know, you you need to be prepared and have that ready to go. Uh, you're going to want to review your records for correcting past violations. Uh, you know, one of OSHA's favorite ways to really um, uh, increase citations is, is, is by issuing repeat citations. Uh, and so, you know, if you've been cited, it's a best practice to abate the citation. And then you want to continue the, to monitor the, that issue to ensure it remains abated. And some of you may be saying, well, what does what a repeat citation mean? What's the big deal? Like I got cited once. I, I got cited, then if I get cited again, you know, so be it. It's, what is it, the max is $15,000? Okay, I get cited $15,000. Again, it's not fun, but what's the big deal? The big deal is that with repeats, the price of the citation for a repeat goes up pretty much exponentially. It, it, it can, you know, they they can be, I believe, you know, over six figures. It can be over $100,000 if there's a repeat. Uh, and so, you know, for that, for that same issue, uh, if you even if you correct it the first time, but then you don't continue to monitor it to, to ensure that it remains abated to the, ex the best extent possible, uh, you know, repeat citations can be pretty significant. Uh, and and that, that can be a challenge sometimes if you're dealing with record keeping issues, 
uh, if you're dealing with um, some of the more mundane citations, like for example, there's housekeeping, uh, there's safe walkway uh, requirements, uh, you know, and, and those can be in, those can those can be a challenge. Uh, guarding can be an issue simply because, uh, you know, uh, not everyone follows the guarding the rules, even though you're supposed to. Uh, especially if you have employers, employees who have been doing uh, in safety for a long time. There was a time, you know, where they 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 probably the they may not have used guards the way they were supposed to and thought it wasn't necessary, uh, and they're used to doing it that way. And you know, trying to teach an old dog new tricks can be uh, can be difficult uh, at times. But you really have to um, enforce your training and and, and make it critical for your culture, uh, and and make it critical that people working um, in circumstances where there could be hazards, understand that, uh, you know, the, these certain, there's certain procedures that have to be followed because if not, uh, people could get hurt and also could expose the company to, um, potential repeat citations. It could, it could have resulted willfuls, uh, if there's issues, uh, you know, for, for not really complying with your safety practices. And so that's just something to be aware of, um, you know, knowing your, your past fight violations and, 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 and correcting them. And making sure that they stay correct. Uh, you want to have proper documentation as well. Uh, and you know this this is kind of uh, really really bringing home the point. But you want to have the documentation of your training, your violations, also your safety related disciplinary action, and that and that's a big one too. Um, there there's there's the potential uh, you know that you can have issues uh, if if there's safety hazards or, you know, employees complained about safety hazards and you don't take action. And so sometimes the police group will say, listen, um, we've done everything that we're supposed to do. Uh, you know, we have the training, we, we, we abated this, we, we monitor it consistently. Um, and when there's been violations of our policies, we've issued appropriate safety disciplinary action. And those can help you uh, from a defense perspective, should you have to say uh, basically that an employee uh, was doing was was engaged in unpreventable employee misconduct, and that's a defense, an affirmative defense. Uh, but um, you know, you, you that's one of the factors, and there's other factors as well. But I but it's just it's just like any other type of employee issue. If you're going to say you know there's no evidence of you know discriminatory animus or something like that, or you know we've taken all necessary action, you're going to need to have the documentation, especially showing that when your policies are violated, that you took the appropriate action. Uh, as I said before, if it's not documented, then it didn't happen. Uh, and, and that's one thing you need to remember uh, that is that if OSHA shows up for an on-site inspection, they're going to ask for a variety of documents. You know, we could talk another day about how to handle document request inspections, uh, but it's just a general rule that you should know uh, that you have to have your documents in order and you should have them uh, in, you should have them in order. And when I say documents in order, I don't just mean having them, but you should have them in a way where they're readily accessible that the individuals who need to access those documents can access them and the individuals that would be required to provide them to OSHA, that they know where to get them, right? If you have documents, but they're, you know, spread all around, they're in these random wet wells all over the place and they're on, you know, uh, they're not managed properly. It, it just it just looks messy. And then, you know, if your documents are in, are in order, uh, you know, that, that leads OSHA to believe that there may be other issues because if you can't keep your documents in order, you know, how, how much do you care about uh, or how much time are you really going to take the time to make sure that these various citations or these various safety has these various safety regulations are being complied with? Uh, and so, you know, where there's smoke, there's OSHA takes a position where there's smoke, there's fire, there's fire. And so uh, if your documentation is not in order, that oftentimes leads them to want to dig in deeper during the course of their on-site inspection. Uh, their interviews say, hey, you know, did you did you receive this training? Did you do this? Did you, did, you know, have you ever seen this happen? Um, and, you know, so good housekeeping and good documentation is a good way to, you know, uh, set a good foundation from the beginning, should there be a, an inspection that OSHA oh, listen, we take safety seriously. Um, you know, it's like making your bed, right? You know, you make, you make your bed, it show, it's, a, it's a reflection of being disciplined. Uh, and so it's, it's, the same, it's the same thing with documentation. Um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about is we've talked about why safety is important to limit exposure. But it's but it's 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 more than that. And listen, it's great to have a, a safe workplace. But I know, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of people who work in safety and they really care about it. But sometimes getting the buy-in 
um, from the, you know, the decision makers or the top level executives or the individuals that, you know, they're the ones who control, uh, you know, the paycheck. They're the ones who control. And I don't mean paycheck in terms of like a, uh, you know, retaliatory measure. I mean, in terms of they're the ones who control uh, the money in terms of what has what what resources and what programs in a company have resources allocated to it. And so sometimes you need to be able to speak the language of money uh, in order to get those decision makers to uh, buy in to invest the resources necessary to create healthy, uh, effective, safe and health programs. And, and so things to consider if you're trying to uh, develop a, a more robust safety program and you need to get the buy-in of the decision makers uh, is that OSHA has, you know, there's, there's regular employee safety is, is essential to maintaining a safe, is, is maintaining to a safe, maintaining a safe workplace. Uh, but if your if your workplace isn't safe, uh, you know people are not going to want to show up to work. They're not going to work as hard. Uh, they're going to work. They're not going to be as productive. Um, you know, you expose the entire workplace to danger, and so that could decrease uh, brand recognition. Again, that can increase morale. Uh, if you don't, if you have bad safety results, depending on the nature of your program. Uh, you may not be uh, entitled or available to submit uh, for particular RFPs because those uh, poor safety results will be uh, marked as a negative factor against you. Uh, and so having bad uh, safety and health programs can result in you, the business's inability to uh, receive new work uh, and receive new projects. And if you can't receive new projects, that means everybody is losing money uh, and decision makers don't like to lose money. Uh, and so those are some of the key reasons from a, from a financial perspective. Again, uh, when you're talking to employers uh, and decision makers about why it's important uh, to have workplace safety, it's just uh, smart business. And so with that, I, I want to thank you for your time and open it up to questions. Um, I think we're at about yep, 145, so I wanted to leave you know 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, if anyone is interested, what I also want to say is that if you reach out to me in my email, I have a handout that I'm happy to send you discussing how to manage an OSHA inspection from the beginning to the end. Uh, and so if you're interested, email me, I'm happy to send it to you. And thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much, Phil. That was like a lot of information that you got through, it's very impressive. Um, so we've got two questions that were um, entered early and then it looks like we've got some questions in the Q&A box. So I'm just going to start with the ones that were submitted early. The first one says, what happens if I did not file my 2022 information? Can I submit it late? I'm not sure what information they're talking about, but maybe you know. Um, if there, I'm, I'm not, I, it's kind of vague. Okay. Uh, I can clarify with the person and then sure and they can reach out. We can figure it out separately. Yeah. I just, you know, I'd, I'd hate to speculate based on, you know, some, you know, and, uh, that's a good point. Um, okay. The next one says Kansas department of labor offers free OSHA style consultation service. Are these recommended to use? Do you have any experience with that? The free OSHA, uh, services. Consultation service. I yeah. Um, well, I don't know if Kansas has a state plan as well. Um, so some, some states have their own particular state plans, right? And so uh, OSHA has like a federal OSHA, but then there's, it allows certain states to create their own plans that can be um, like, the, you know, uh, that, could, that they can use to enforce OSHA as well. And they can have their own requirements. They can be more stringent than the overall federal state plan. So it's like, hey, you can't be less stringent than OSHA, but if you want to do more and, and take our, you know, our, our regulations and kind of uh, add additional things to, to, to focus on the safety and health of your state, you can do that. So there's various OSHA state plans. I don't recall if Kansas is a state plan, but I do know that OSHA does offer these. Uh, I would just say that I, you know, I think very closely before I did that uh, because you are, you know, uh, letting OSHA onto your facility. And of course, nothing is supposed to happen. And, you know, uh, it's supposed to be a complimentary thing for the benefit of, of everyone. But, you know, I think that if, you know, um, and, and again, it depends on the size of your company and, and what you can afford. But I, I think, you know, if you can get a, a retained professional 
uh, to help you with those issues and, and give you guidance, uh, again, which is in the best interest to, of you, the employer, both from a safety perspective, but also from uh, you know, other perspectives, which maybe to the benefit of the employer, it's really worth considering as opposed to OSHA, their, their focus is you know, safety only, but it's from the government's perspective, so to speak. And so I think, you know, would you want the government, you know, which again, it's, it's, I don't, it, it's certainly a resource, but, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, get a, get counsel involved and they can understand some of the other potential issues, uh, that could exist. I think that's probably the better approach. Hmm. seems like there could be a potential of conflict of interest there. You know, I, I just think that if you can afford uh, a professional, whether it's counsel or, uh, you know, an uh, independent auditor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, it's strong. It's worth considering uh, because I think, again, one of the biggest things is that you can put a attorney client privilege over uh, that process. And that way that could that could be conducive to you later, as opposed to there's no privilege or protection uh from you know osha's and uh, invest you know evaluation or help and especially one thing you need to understand with osha is that any documents are created they are public records right and you can get those through what's called a FOIA request and so you may not want that to happen and so you may decide so again being able to being able to i think control the process as an employer and or a business and and then evaluate risk in a way that creates the greatest amount of protection for you, to me, is something that I think employers and companies would, should, should consider. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. That's a great question. Um, okay, how long do we need to keep training records for? Depends on the training records. Uh, but typically record, typically you'll wanna keep, uh, you know, at least you know three years five years depending on what it is like if you're looking at osha 300 again those aren't training records um you know there's certain records I and mean, it depends i'd have to look but it, there's certain things that you need to keep if there's like medical records and stuff like 30 years uh, and so osha has different regulations regarding how long to keep things uh but i would definitely I, again i'd have to look at the particular one but um you know don't get rid of them anytime soon is a, is a, is a uh, best practice <laughs> Okay, that sounds good. Uh, last one we have here is you mentioned an attorney, an attorney on routine audits. What kind of attorney would you recommend doing an audit? Um, a workplace safety attorney. Yes, I do them for clients across the country all the time. Uh, so if you want to use an attorney, a workplace safety attorney, I wouldn't use you know, like your bankruptcy attorney to do them because they're not going to be familiar with OSHA's regulations uh, and, and uh, safety requirements uh, and, and probably wouldn't be familiar with how OSHA's interpreted the regulations because uh, understanding case law and the regulations can help you understand things to look for, things you can't, you know, just, just understanding the process. So, and so you definitely want a workplace safe, an attorney who's familiar or practices in workplace safety. Okay, that's great to know. Awesome. And then, um, so as I mentioned earlier in the call, uh, I'm going to send out the follow-up email either later today or tomorrow. That's going to have directions on how you can access the free um, wages and hours, or I'm sorry, not wages, um, workplace safety compliance manual, and also have Phil's um, contact information, my contact information. But can you just remind everybody how to receive those free resources that you were Sure. Email me and ask for them. My email's right there, pbalkman at officialphillips.com. If you're interested in the free handout on how to manage an OSHA inspection, uh, it's pretty detailed. It's not just, uh, you know, um, one page, three bullet points. It goes through each each section from initial, uh, you know, when OSHA shows up to the opening conference, to the walkthrough, to the closing conference, to considerations for, you know, uh, contesting citations and things of that nature. And so it gives you a lot of high uh, of information for you to consider uh, to help you put together a plan. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Phil. That is really, um, that's really generous of you to offer. I'm putting the Sherman HRCI credit codes in the chat right now. They will also be in the follow-up email if you can't take them down here. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, Phil. This My was- pleasure. Great information. You are a real expert at this. So we really appreciate you coming and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Uh, hope to hope to hear from you guys soon.
Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining, and we will see you next time. Have a I'll great day. Bye.